Um, that's it. Why don't we go to the next slide, Christina? This is the introduction, and I'm going to turn it over to Frank Edwagishik, who is the co-chair of the NCAI Federal Recognition Task Force. Thanks for being with us today, Frank. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, I'm the co-chair for the Federal Recognition Task Force at NCAI. We've uh, we've been in existence well over a decade. We were founded at by resolution at the Spokane. Uh, NCAI meeting uh, a number of years ago, and we're been the focus of the issues surrounding the federal recognition process. And in our in our discussions, and have been many suggestions over the years on how the process could be improved. And also, we've aired a lot of the issues that have been that have what we believe is the reason why there were revisions necessary, uh, such as the immense cost, the very long time that things were taking. And uh, I have some personal experience being a retired tribal chairman and that our tribe was in the process and our number was such a high number that we felt that, that we were never going to be able to get through it. We ended up going through a legislative process which everybody knows is very difficult, but we were successful in 94. There were tribes that were in the process when we were there that are still in the process today. And they it's just an example of the length of time that this process is taking. It's uh, been very difficult to meet the standards. The standards seem to be a bit, they, they while the written standards are the same, things seemed to get more and more difficult as time went by. And we have passed several resolutions by regional organizations and by NCAI talking about how this process was broken. Pretty much everybody agreed that it was broken and it needed to be fixed, not to make it, uh, not to lower the, criteria, the standards of what it would take to be federally recognized, but so much to make the process more fair, more transparent, and to give people some hope that their process actually was one that would result in, in federal recognition. Because for so many years, it seemed like it was one that, that was going so slow that the process seemed to be designed to be a roadblock. And that's what it appeared to so many of us that were in the process of working on trying to become federally recognized. Well, over the years, we met with several of the assistant secretaries of the interior about this issue and tried to get movement. When Kevin Washburn and Larry first came in to office, in fact, they, we met with them at a time when they were so new they had yet to have their cards printed. And we, uh, the co-chairs of the Federal Recognition Task Force, along with other folks from NCAI, met with them and asked them um, what their position was going to be on this issue and if we could uh, encourage them to take action. Uh, the Assistant Secretary assured us that this was a high priority item and that he had assigned to this, to the, the Deputy Assistant, to Larry Roberts, the task of working on this project. And then they proceeded to work, and what we're going to have today is the outcome of their, uh, of their meeting their pledge that they would work on this issue and hoped to be successful. And also, it, it, it's the, uh, the result of so many people's work from so many different, different, uh, different places around the country with input from people on both pro and con on these various issues. And what we're going to hear today is a great deal of the specifics of how this has come, come to fruition. And what we, now that we're starting this next step, and the next step is looking at these regulations and how they will be implemented, what kind of things we're going to need to know. Um, we're, there's going to be a lot of having to make definitions and understanding what these things actually mean. And with that in mind, that's what we were hoping to have 
when this um, when this red this whole webinar was first brought into being. And with that, I'd like to I'd like to introduce Assistant Secretary Kevin Washburn and the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Larry Roberts. And gentlemen, I, it, I'm, we're all eager to to hear what you have to say today. Thank you very much, Frank. And um, what Frank said is true. The, he, he largely uh, inspired this um, and, and frankly kept it going. Um, he met with us very early on. Um, when we started here, the department had looked at this a bit. In fact, Brian Newland had done a lot of good work on this. And um, the cab our cabinet secretary at the time, Ken Salazar, was very interested in us doing something because he'd had a lot of colleagues over the years saying that this process is broken. and. Um, He's, he, so between Ken Salazar and, and Frank Edogishik and John Norwood, we had a lot of people sort of um, pushing us to do this and so we and giving us support and encouraging us. And so we really appreciated that. It wouldn't have happened without all of that support um, from, from the beginning. Um, I was joking with Larry here that um, when Frank came and asked us to do this, maybe we were kind of naive <laughs> because it's been a challenge. But, um, but like I said, we've had a lot of support. Um, really, what uh, you know, we, the, the need for reform was um, was uh, was great. Um, um, people had talked about the process being broken. In fact, I think about a half dozen uh, chairs of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs had called the process broken. That it was slow, expensive, burdensome, inefficient, intrusive, not very transparent, and unpredictable and arbitrary. And um, what Frank said was something that we heard, which is that the standards just seem to keep getting ratcheted upward and upward. And um, we, we, you know, we tried to take a look at that. Um, there had been a lot of people who had looked at the process. And you know, these regs have only been ex in existence since 1978. And they haven't changed very much since 1978. Only 18 tribes have been recognized by, through this process since 1978. And 34 tribes have been denied or disapproved. So. We um, really started to look for what you know. What do we do about this? What's the um, what, you know? What do we if we we've heard that the process is broken, but people weren't terribly specific sometimes in what they meant by that. Um, so one of the places we looked to for potential reforms was congressional hearings. Um, we read transcripts of numerous congressional hearings to try to get ideas of what the problem was. Um, we also note that the process had drawn scrutiny from both the GAO and um, also from our own Inspector General here at Interior. So there had been a lot of people opining on it, and um, we decided there needed to be some changes. So um, we convened a team of people within the department to look at all the potential ideas. And I think they came up with about 110 different reform ideas, and we ultimately decided to pursue about 30 of them or something like that. And we prepared a discussion draft. Um, and Liz Apple, who headed up that, is here at the table with me as I'm talking. And um, she really spearheaded all the regulatory process, including 13 different consultation sessions and public meetings so that over the course of two different summers, 2013 and 2014, so we could get feedback, first on a discussion draft and then on a proposed rule. And um, we received hundreds and hundreds of comments. And ultimately, the final rule reflects trying to uh, read all those comments and um, be respectful to all of them and, and accept some of them. Um, and um, we received comments from tribes, from state and local governments, from petitioning groups, from organizations and individuals. And um, we had just a lot of input. So we um, really, to turn to the revisions to the Part 83 process, Patty Ferguson Bonney, who uh, was terrific because she helped develop comments, and we received a big uh, set of comments from law professors, which were very compelling. And she's going to walk you through a lot of the details. But let me hit some of the high points of the things that we were we thought were important. One of them is this. Recognition is a simple matter of justice. If a group is a tribe, it deserves to be recognized. And um, that, at the bottom, is the, the, the driving force here. Um, it, there, it's got to be about justice. Um, the status of being federal recognized should not be withheld from any tribe that deserves it. And um, that's you know, easier said than, than done, because it does, it's a very rigorous process. 
Um, but it, and it needs to be rigorous because we need everybody to have confidence that a group that makes it through it is the legitimate tribe. Um, but um, ultimately, we have to make sure that legitimate tribes are recognized. Um, one of the other things that guided, guided us was transparency. To some people, I think they felt like this, this is um, you know, coming out of a black box. The decisions are just sort of sprung out of a black box, and there was mystery in the process. We decided that there should be a lot of input and a lot of transparency in the process. So we found ways to make it more transparent um, by, for example, putting lots of documents up on the website. We can't do that with Privacy Act protected documents, for example, but we've got a lot of the evidence that we can put up on the website. We're going to do that so that people can examine the evidence themselves and comment upon it. We also think the integrity of the process is really, really important. So we learned in our review that the seven criteria themselves are sacrosanct because in the discussion draft we proposed changing them quite a bit. And ultimately in the final rule we didn't change them as much as we'd originally proposed. But people don't want to see the standards weakened. They think they you know, need to be exceedingly rigorous and we agree with that. Um, and um, like I said, Patty's going to go into some of the details of those changes, and I'll, I'll sort of save that from her, for her. But um, let me just talk about one um, that turns out to be fairly important. We had, in the discussion draft, proposed moving the starting date forward to 1934 um, for for some of the for two of the key criteria, and um, we got a lot of pushback about that. Um, it turns out, you know, ultimately, almost any date you choose is arbitrary from, from some, in some respects. But um, we, so the, the date of 1900 is a compromise. Um, it's, um, it's uh, you know, it's, it's um, well, it's a compromise. It's, it's, a diff it's not as um, recent as 1934, but it um, creates a, con a nationwide standard that applies, uh, you know, across the country that treats everybody the same. And so everybody will have the same starting date. It will be across the board. So that um, is good and it preserves rigor because it's more than a century. One of the other changes that I should talk about is Criterion A. Um, we previously said that a petitioning group must prove its Indian identity continuously from 1900 to the present using evidence from sources external to the tribe. And we got a lot of pushback. That was that was our you know the existing criteria um, A, and um, we got a lot of pushback on that because the massacre at Wounded Knee had just occurred in 1890. So Indians you know uh, were still being murdered um, at that time. And secondly, shortly after 1900, uh, people started stealing kids from Indian reservations to take them to to boarding schools. Um, and so what we heard from petitioning groups is that we shouldn't have to provide external evidence of our existence since 1900 because much of that time we were trying to hide from the people that were trying to murder us and steal our children. And that seemed somewhat compelling to us. So we originally thought about getting rid of Criterion A altogether, um, but we got a lot of pushback on that. So ultimately what we said is you have to prove your, ident your identity continuously from 1900 to the present, but you don't have to use sources external to the tribe. Um, you could use your own credible sources uh, and evidence if you have it. So that was sort of, again, another, another compromise, and we think a fair compromise. Um, but um, those were sort of the nature. It gives you a sense of how we achieved the, the final result to what we got to. We also sought to expedite the process. And um, we heard, like Frank just said, that you know, we heard from tribes that had been through the process that said, look, we made it through. But it took far too long and it cost us far too much. Um, and so we worked on expediting decisions, not just positive decisions, but also negative decisions. And so we found ways to do that. We also, though, added a little bit of process as well, which in some ways may lengthen some of these, but it will it'll ensure fairness to the, um, to the parties. The last thing that I'll talk about, really, um, is that um, we also heard um, the criticism that the standards keep getting ratcheted upward. And so one of the things that we also included was the notion that past decisions will serve as precedent for future decisions. In other words, we need to ensure the criteria are applied equally over time and fairly um, over time. So 
that means that um, you know if the standard was good enough or uh, evidence was good enough in 1980 or 1990, um, it should be good enough in 2015. And so we really worked to Im import that idea into the criterion. So. That's kind of where we ended up, and there was a lot of work that went into this, and um, we are, uh, you know, there's probably a lot more to talk about, but um, I'm going to, I think that, um, I'll stop there, um, and um, let's, Patty, turn it over to Patty in just a moment. I'm going to ask Larry if he'd like to say any words at all, because he actually worked really, really hard on this as well, and um, we're really um, pleased the way it turned out. It's not going to make everybody's hopes and dreams, but it's, um, but it's, um, it, it was, a, we believe it's a, it's a good compromise. And um, I'll stop there. Thanks, Kevin. So um, I would just underscore the importance of the consistent baseline for criteria. We've heard that through the travel consultations and public meetings in terms of ensuring that while the, while the standards have not changed, that they continue to be applied to everyone equally. I would um, also just add that, you know, we've, We've, we've added a, a step in the process for, for those petitioners that do get uh, proposed negative findings where they will have a hearing before uh, an administrative law judge. And, and some of the comments that we heard from folks on um, that hearing process was that it was important to have it before an administrative law judge, somebody who is um, independent and, um, and um, neutral so that they can make recommendations to the assistant secretary Finally, um, I would just add that um, one of, you know, we've invested a lot of, of time and effort in, um, in reforming the process. Um, and one, as, a, as a result of that, one of the things that we also want to make um, clear to everyone is that now that we've reformed the process, that this is the process we're going to be using moving forward. And so that um, it's just one process now. It's not... Um, uh, we're not going to utilize processes where there's um, uh, a reaffirmation or half-blood community or other processes. We want to. We think it's important both for um, the public and for petitioners to know that this is the process that we'll be using uh, moving forward. Um, and um, we look forward to um, receiving documented petitions so that OFA can can start moving and uh, and uh, getting these decisions out because they've worked. Uh, the OFA staff have worked tirelessly, both on helping us to reform the process, but also on um, uh, working on the petitions that were before us as uh, this rule was being promulgated. So you heard from the Department of the Interior. This is Kevin Washburn again, and um, we are really grateful to NCAI for um, holding this opportunity to educate folks on the rule, and we're grateful again to Frank Etowagishik for his leadership and to Professor Ferguson Bonney for providing this. We are going to step off, and we won't be um, participating uh, anymore, but um, we wanted to certainly um, participate in this first webinar because we um, are really grateful that it's occurring and we want everybody to be educated on this rule too. As everyone knows, um, it's been a controversial subject and um, there may be more action in Congress related to it and it helps us if everybody at least is educated about it. We don't mind people disagreeing with us, but we want them to have a good basis for their disagreement. So thank you all. Um, Patty, why don't I turn it over to you? Okay, I am going to discuss the criteria, and basically we're going to review the criteria, the types of evidence that can be used for each criteria, and the changes um, from the old criteria to the new criteria. Hold on one second. Okay. I hope you can hear me. I assume that you can hear me. Um, we can hear you well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I like the feedback. Um, so criteria A is Indian entity identification. And um, this criteria, as uh, Assistant Secretary Washburn mentioned, uh, changed minimally. But I think it's important just to review the criteria so everyone knows what it is and where we are. And what I've done on these slides is I've shown what the changes are from 83.7 to 83.11, which is the new criteria. So. Indian entity identification is that the, the tribe has been identified as an Indian entity on a substantially continuous basis since 1900. 
even though your character has changed from time to not, from time to not, time to time, um, they will not be considered to be conclusive evidence that the criterion hasn't been met, hasn't been met. Um, and you can use one or more types of evidence to meet this criterion. Um, specifically, you can use identification as Indian entity by federal authorities, anthropologists, historians, other scholars. You can be identified in newspapers, books. You, if you have relationships with Indian tribes or with national, regional, or state organizations, or Indian organizations, or by the petitioner um, itself, yourself. And so the real change, as Assistant Secretary Washburn mentioned, was really the change from limiting it to external identification. So now it adds that the identification can be made by petitioner. So that's the one change in Criterion A. So if you've been working on your petitions, um, and you can use this new information uh, for Criterion A. The next criterion is Criterion B, which I call distinct community. Um, on the criterion, it says community, but I think as uh, petitioners, we usually um, discuss this as distinct or social community, and then criterion C as political community. And as you can see, um, the baseline has changed here. You have to show that you're a distinct community uh, that's existed since 1900 to the present, um, and that distinct community means an Indian means an entity with consistent interactions and significant social relationships within its membership, and that its members are differentiated and distinct from non-members. This must be understood flexibly in the context of the history, geograph geography, culture, and social organization of the entity, and that, um, that language was really pushed by um, individuals in the, in the comments, and so the Assistant Secretary's Office adopted that. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the big change in distinct community um, is really from historical times to the present was changed to this underlined uh, 1900. That was a big change. But um, the types of evidence, there are two buckets here. One is you can provide two or more of the following types of evidence. Um, endogamy, which is intermarriage, patterned out marriages, social relationships, informal social interactions, shared labor or other economic activity, or shared sacred or secular ritual activity. Those are really relationships within the group. And you can also use evidence such as patterns of discrimination or other social distinctions by non-members. You can use distinct cultural patterns that differentiate you from the non-Indian population. You can uh, demonstrate that your collective Indian identity has existed over a period of more than 50 years, even though the name may have changed. You can, if you have land set aside by the state, if you attended, if your members attended Indian educational institutions, or if you meet political influence under 8311C1, which we'll talk about. So if you have two or more of those for a point in time, you can meet distinct community. This is from 1900 to the present. If you have one or more of the following, then you can also meet this criterion for a point in time. So if you have 50% or more members who reside in a geographical <clears throat> area exclusively or almost exclusively composed of your members, and, and the balance of your membership maintains contact with members living in that area. If you have 50% or more intermarriage within your tribe, or you have distinct cultural patterns um, uh, that are different from, from non-members. Um, so that, you have to show 50% or more. And you can also uh, use other evidence from 8311C2. But the big changes um, is that it replaces historic times with 1900, which is a, reduces the burden on petitioners, describes what distinct community means. It adds some things that can be used as evidence, which includes land set aside by a state. It adds Indian educational institutions. It clarifies how you treat 
endogamy. Um, and that's really important because instead of treating um, each marriage as one, each tribal member's uh, it's treated at per tribal member. Um, and so that can increase your percentage for meeting this criterion. It also removes discretion um, because now you have to have two or more types of evidence under part one of this criterion. Um, so that's distinct community. And these are just brief overview. Um, 83.11c is political community. And basically, this is showing that you have political influence or authority over your members since from 1900 to the present. And it defines that this means the entity uses a council, leadership, internal processes, or an, another mechanism as a means of influencing or controlling the behavior of its members. And that deals with making decisions, that it substantially affects its members, or representing the entity and dealing with outsiders and matters of consequence. And again, this language was added that a lot of um, members of the task force propose is that this process has to be understood in the context of the history, culture, and social organization of the entity. And so there's also types of evidence that is listed, and it's broken into two buckets. The first is two or more, and it's whether you're able to mobilize your members, um, whether your members consider the issues acted upon or actions taken by leadership to be important, um, involvement in the political process by the members. If you meet the distinct community in 8311b2, which was that second bucket, if you show that 50% or more of your members are intermarried for a certain time period um, or live in a specific geographical area, you can meet political community for the same time period. Um, also, you can show how you resolve internal conflicts, if you have relationships with federally recognized tribes, if you have land set aside by the state, and if you can show continuous line of leadership. Two or more of these helps you meet the uh, political community. Or if you have one of the following. Um, you have leadership or me mechanisms that allocate tribal resources, settle disputes, that exert strong influence on the behavior of individuals, or organize or influence economic subsistence activities among the members. And so if you meet distinct community for 50% or more here, then you meet political community. Hey, Patricia, this is John Dossett. Maybe we should take a moment and see if there's any questions about the, that's a, you've covered quite a bit of ground so far. Um, Christina, did you have any questions come in yet? Yes, we have a few questions um, from Nancy Carley. She said, Patty said the petitioner had to maintain contact with members. Should it not be the members maintaining contact with the tribe? I, I think that's a fair question. I think you have to show how your members interact. Your members are the tribe. Um, so you have to show that there's consistent interaction. That's how I read it. If there's someone else, um, someone else might have a, a different um, interpretation. But you have to show patterns of social interaction among the members of the, of the tribe. Okay. Any other questions, Christina? Um, if a tribe went through the previous process and was denied, why can a tribe not go back through the process due to changes in evidence requirements? I think that's a good question. I think uh, that was initially in the proposed rule and it it was removed. Um, and I think, I, I can't really speak to that, but I think there was a lot of um, give and take in the political process as to why that occur occurred. I wasn't in the behind the scenes. We've also got a hand raised um, from Leanne Easton. I'm going to unmute her line to ask one more question. Thanks. Hello, Leanne. What's your question? Um, I, I was, it was a similar question to the, the, the question that was just asked. 
So I, I think you answered it. Thank you. Oh, sure. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that was, I think, one of the toughest issues in these regulations, at least when Kevin Washburn talked to NCI about it at the mid-year meeting. He said that was a really difficult one. There was a lot of pressure coming from Congress, and it went up to the White House, and it was a, a very difficult issue, and I think not a compromise that was a comfortable one to make, but they wound up, that's where that decision wound up. Um, and then, so I'll just leave it at that. Back to back to you, Patricia. Also, I just wanted to mention we have a copy of the revised um, Part 83 in the handout section for participants. Oh, good. Thanks. And I, I'm thinking back on Vice Chairwoman's question just before I move on from um, this social and political community under 83. Point eleven uh, B two one. The language specifically says, like, as a way to prove a distinct community or political community at a given point in time, if you can show that fifty percent of your members live in a geographical area um, almost exclusively or exclusively, and the balance of the tribe maintains consi consistent interaction with some members of people who reside in that area, you can meet the criterion for that point in time. So that may have been where I, I confused things. It's the people who live in that, uh, that specific area, um, almost exclusively, exclusively occupied by tribal members, they must maintain the members, the balance of the members, most of them need to maintain contact with the people who live in that community. For you to use that um, type of evidence to meet the criterion for that point in time. Um, I, hope, I hope that's helpful. OK, um, so uh, political community, we went through this. You can use um, information and evidence from B2, which is social community, to also meet political community. But one of the things uh, that I want to mention is talk about, I think we can move to the next slide, really, is the changes. Uh, in political community, and this is replacing historical tri historical times with 1900, uh, which is the same for social community, and it adds relationships with governments of fairly recognized tribes as uh, types of evidence. It adds land set aside by the state as types of evidence. It adds continuous if you have a continuous leadership process as a type of evidence. Um, it also removes the discretion by requiring two or more forms of evidence under Part 1. And um, I think attorneys uh, might talk about the, the last change that I noted, which is it changes shall to will um, and what that might mean. Okay, the next criterion is governing, governing document and membership criteria. And there was really, there's no change to this criterion. Um, it just says the petitioner has to provide a copy of your government document, um, including your membership criteria. And if you don't have that, you have to have a written statement describing your membership criteria and your governing procedures. The next criterion is E, which I, th I think is a huge uh, huge criterion that probably a lot of tribes will spend time on, which is descent from a historic tribe or tribe. And the initial description of criterion E didn't change. You have to show that your membership consists of individuals who descend from a historical tribe or tribes that combine and function as a single autonomous political entity. The changes are really, or the clarifications are really on what types of evidence can be used to meet criterion E. Um, first, if you have a tribal role, um, that is a type of available evidence that you can use um, to meet criterion E. I think you can move to the next slide, thanks. Um, so if you have a tribal role directed by Congress or prepared by the secretary, um, if you don't have a tribal role, then you have to use other sorts of documents to prove descent from a historic tribe or tribes, which is a federal, state, or other official records 
church, school, or other similar enrollment records, records cr created by historians and anthropologists in historical times, affidavits of recognition by tribal elders, leaders, or tribal governing body if they have personal knowledge, and other records are evidence. So there is a big change um, in Criterion E, which is how historical is defined. Uh, when uh, Carl Artman was Assistant Secretary, he uh, issued guidance that his historical times was defined as 1789. And in this new rule, historical is defined as prior to 1900. So at the early at the point you have prior to 1900, where you can show descent from a historical t tribe, you will determine that, and then you will provide that evidence. Um, it has to be the most recent evidence prior to 1900, and that's in page 23 on the response to the comments. It also clarifies, though not in the um, actual criteria but in the response to the comments that the petitioner may use records created by historians and anthropologists if it's drawing these conclusions from historical records. Um, and so I think that that's something that tribes will be looking at and seeing how that will apply in this con context. I think those are, are the, um, the most glaring changes to Criterion E. I think people will probably have questions about that and more discussions about that. And in the comments, it reflects on how you can, how we need to look to past precedent. And if we met this at a particular time, how you might be able to use that. And that's something that uh, students in the clinic are going to be looking at. Um, criterion F is unique membership. And so basic. Basically, this is um, that the petitioner's membership is composed principally of persons who are not members of any fairly recognized Indian tribe. And um, the big change here is that the, it clarifies that the petitioner must be politically autonomous since 1900. So even if the petitioner um, members may have been on other roles, um, if it if the tribe demonstrates those functions separately since 1900 and can meet B and C, and the members provide written confirmation of their membership, then you satisfy unique membership. And so that's the real change in Criterion F. And then Criterion G is termination. And basically, the petitioner nor its members may be subject to congressional legislation that terminates or forbids the federal relationship. And the big change, which I've identified in the bold letters at the bottom, is that it clarifies that the petitioner does not need to submit evidence to prove this criterion. So that's a brief overview of the seven criteria. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, well, that was a lot of information. Uh, there may be some questions out there. Uh, we also, uh, Arlinda Locklear has joined us on the call. Thank you so much, Arlinda. Uh, Arlinda is a, a very well-respected attorney who's worked a great deal on the federal acknowledgement process and represented a, a number of tribes going through it over the years. And we had asked Arlinda if she would maybe help, help us kick off the discussion with some of her thoughts about the changes in the process and uh, and then we'll go to questions. Uh, Arlinda, can you, uh, what, what are your thoughts overall about the changes? Well, thank you, John, and, and I appreciate the invitation to join everybody today. This is obviously a subject near and dear to a lot of our hearts, including mine, and um, I'm uh, very happy to participate. Uh, let me start off by saying um, that while the department emphasizes that it has maintained at least superficially the structure of the seven mandatory criteria with the changes that Patty just walked through for you, um, it's important to look at how those work together and the particular language that's used in each of those seven criteria. The reason I emphasize that is because I think this particular set of regulations gives us as petitioners much greater flexibility in how we interpret and prove 
those seven mandatory criteria than we had under the old regulations. Um, in particular, for example, it significantly decreases the heavy reliance of the old regulations on proof of actual interaction. Um, you can read, if you look carefully at the language, particularly at the B and C criteria, you will see that there is much more opportunity to prove the criteria by more objective uh, forms of evidence and also to significantly decrease your reliance on the need for proof of actual interaction, which in particular for larger tribes has been a problem. So what I'd like to do is walk through the same criteria very briefly that Patty just did, and instead of giving you the complete overview, just focus on what appears to me to be the opportunities that these regulations present in terms of how you actually begin the work now on preparation of a petition in the hope that we're going to see the legitimate tribes recognized now instead of some of them actually being turned down as they have in the past. Um, let, let me start, first of all, by commenting on uh, the standard of review. Um, it says in 83.10A2 that substantially continuous basis of proof is required for all of the criteria. Um, now that's a concept that the, the, the concept of uh, substantial continuity is one that is carried over from the old regulations. But this particular language creates a little bit of confusion that I think we're going to have to see how, it, how it's fleshed out in application. And here's why. This, this set of regulations, unlike the old regulations, uses the same concept, substantially continuous basis, to apply across the board to all the criteria. But under the old regulations, they had developed, at least in practice, different rules of continuity for different criteria. For example, criterion A was, even though it didn't appear in the regulations, the, the department would tell you they wanted proof every 10 years since 1900 of external identification of the group. And that's how they interpreted substantially continuous for purposes of A. But then for purposes of B and C, where you're looking at community and political authority, they defined continuity on a generation basis under the old regulations, so they looked for evidence roughly every 20 years. Now, because they use the same term, substantial, con substantially continuous basis, for all the criteria here, we're really not sure what they mean. And particularly because they, they insist upon um, your ability to rely on old precedent, it really does create a bit of a uh, ambiguity there as to whether you're talking about 10 years or 20 years or as to which criterion. So I think that's going to have to be fleshed out a little bit, and I would just urge everybody to be sensitive in particular to the prior precedent and the difference that those different terms, different periods of time that were used to define this term for the different criteria. OK, the criterion themselves, um, I'd like to point out particular things that, that um, I think you should pay attention to that give us hope for flexibility on these. Um, as Patty has indicated under criterion A, they have added identification as an Indian entity by the petitioner that itself. We had all been concerned about criterion A because it suggests that a tribe could actually prove it existed as a tribal community under B, C, and E and still not be able to prove external identification and be turned down. Well, the addition of this last language, as Patty indicated, is very important because that gives you the flexibility to say, well, we did something ourselves that showed we were in an Indian identity, and that counts as evidence as well. So in my mind, it seems to me very likely that any group that can prove B and C, that is community and political authority, can use the same evidence to prove that it identified itself as an Indian entity and satisfy A. So I think I would encourage you to consider the same evidence that you would use for B and C as evidence to satisfy the seventh form of, of uh, classification under the A criterion and the hope that there's no daylight for all practical purposes between A, B, and C. On B itself, um, the definition of community. I think even the very definition of community that's used shows the tendency of this regulation to decrease the dependence on, on proof of actual interaction. 
by dropping predominant portion, as Patty pointed out in the definition of the B criterion, and relying, re requiring only consistent interactions and significant social relations, means that you no longer have to prove that 50% of the membership interact with each, each other on a substantially continuous basis. It doesn't tell us how much less than 50%, but it is less. And because it is less than 50%, it necessarily reduces the need to prove actual interaction among all your tribal members. Um, most of the criteria or forms of evidence under that criterion are the same, but I, I want to point um, this particular language to your particular attention. If you look at, under the A criterion, 111. Roman numeral XI, it says a demonstration of political influence under criterion 83.11C1 will be evidence for demonstrating distinct community for that same period of time. Even under the old regulations, there was a lot of overlap between B and C, in particular what they referred to as the high evidence standard. If you met that high evidence, geographic concentration of 50% or more, 50% intermarriage, then you automatically proved both B and C. Well, under this regulation, they give you even greater flexibility by suggesting that proof of political authority on any basis, not just the high evidence, but any form of evidence for political authority automatically proves for that same time period the existence of community as well. So what I would encourage folks to do is when they start thinking about putting together a petition, focus on C first because there's an argument that we'll get to in a moment that you have even greater flexibility under C for avoiding the proof of actual interaction among your members. So that if you can prove C and then rely on C as proof of B under this language here, Roman numeral I1, then you've proven them both. So we have much greater overlap now in the evidence between B and C than we did under the old regulations. Um, on the C criterion itself, um, they have basically taken the requirement for proof of actual interaction between the leadership and the membership, or what they used to refer to as bilateral political relations, out of the process altogether. First of all, they have expressly declined to include bilateral political action relations as an obligation. That didn't appear in the old regulations either, but by interpretation uh, from the solicitor's office, that had been effectively imposed, superimposed on the explicit language of the regulations themselves as an additional requirement, as part of the necessary proof on political authority. That's now gone. So that whole concept of bilateral political relations, which requires proof of actual interaction, is gone. So, Let's look then at the language and how they define political authority here, and you can see again a decrease in reliance on the proof of actual interaction. They start out by saying the petitioner has maintained political influence or authority over its members, um, and that shall mean the entity uses a council, leadership, internal process, or other mechanism as a means of influence in influencing the behavior of its members, comma, making decisions for the entity which substantially affects its members and or, the disjunctive there, representing the entity in dealing with outsiders in matters of consequence. Now, what that says to me is that you can prove political authority by identifying a list of leaders which, uh, with means of success, uh, if succession, that have represented the group to outsiders in matters of consequence, and that is sufficient. It tells you you have to do it by these means listed below, but that's how they define. That's one possible definition of political influence that doesn't require any proof of actual interaction, particularly in the absence of bilateral political relations. And that significantly increases the flexibility you have on the means that you use for proving C which is, again, important because you can then go back and use that as evidence as of on B as well. They've used basically the same kinds of evidence. They've expanded it a little bit on the kind of evidence that you can use. But if you look in particular at 
Little Roman numeral eight, it says there is a continuous line of entity leaders and a means of selection or acquiescence by a significant number of the entity's members. Again, the disjunctive is used there, not the conjunctive. So you can identify a continuous line of leaders and a means of, and a means of selection without more, and that, that, that is one acceptable form of evidence. Now, you do have to have two, but it gives you half of your case right there without any proof of actual inter interaction between the political leaders and, and, the, and the membership itself. Again, getting away from the necessity to prove all of the subjective, the subjective evidence that OFA oftentimes would just arbitrarily reject or accept um, on bilateral political relations. Um, the D criterion is pretty much the same as, as Patty has described it. I would like to say a little bit more about the E criterion, though. As Patty has identified, that is a very significant change. Um, because even though 1789 had been, had been the beginning point for B, C, and E all along, it was that one criterion, E, proof of descent from a historic tribe, proved to be the most difficult for non-federally recognized tribes for the very good reason that nobody was keeping roles of such tribes as of 1789. There was no reason to, typically, and in fact, on the contrary, those folks were trying to stay as far away from the dominant society they could as a means of survival. But the way that rule had been interpreted before, unless you could somehow compile, for all practical purposes, a complete role as of 1789, you had very little chance of proving E because you couldn't prove a genealogical connection to somebody in 1789. Well, that's no longer necessary. Now, the, the beginning date is, is 1899 or before, so that we're at a modern point in time where there are federal census records and others that can much more easily uh, be compiled as the sort of base role to identify the historic membership of the tribe, and that's that's very important. Equally important um, is their emphasis in this criterion on the prior precedent in other cases, um, and in particular in the discussion in the in the preliminary discussion on the comments, they identify a number of petitions that indicate real flexibility on the application of this criterion. They point to Timbisha Shoshone, Porch Creek, and Tunica Biloxi. Many of those, Tunica Biloxi, for example, relied on proof of E uh, from documents that surround the period from the late 1890s as, as late as 1930s. So even though the beginning point may be 1899, you should make sure when you're working on the E criterion that you begin your discussion with the prior precedent that you rely on to point out, for example, that Ruth Underhill, an, anthropo an anthropologist who reported on Tunica in the 1930s, was acceptable proof of descent in that case. So that Swanton could be, in 1907, could be acceptable proof of Homa descent um, for the Homa petitioners. This, the combination of the later start date along with um, the, the precedent from other cases gives you a lot more flexibility in how the E criterion is interpreted. So I think sort of my bottom line is that this, while this is not everything we had hoped for, in particular I think a number of us are disappointed that the repetitioning provision was left out and that is fundamentally unfair, um, that nonetheless this represents very substantial reform in a meaningful and beneficial way for petitioning tribes. And I would encourage you to approach it that way and to look for opportunities to adduce evidence that avoids reliance on actual interaction, which I think these regulations allow you to do, and, and weave into any submission you make your reliance on the appropriate decisions in the past that have identified either forms of evidence or time periods of evidence that are acceptable. Well, thank you so much, Arlinda. Um, that was just terrific analysis, just greatly appreciated. Is, um, you know, now we want to 
turn to the audience and see if there are questions. And hopefully, our Linda, you'll stick around, and and, and Patty, and and we can uh, see if we can try to answer any questions. Uh, and I think uh, you know Frank Edwagishik, the chair of the task force, is also on the phone. Um, so if you'd like to raise your hands, you do that by clicking the raise hand button, or you can. You can also type questions into the box, and we'll read them out. I, I think it's a little bit easier if you can just ask the question yourself by raising your hand, and we'll we'll do our best to answer them. Are there any questions? What do you have so far, Christina? We have a raised hand from Dorothy Alter, so I'm going to unmute her line. Hi, Dorothy. Um, hi. My question was dealing with. Um, I have a client, and there. Their current membership um, criteria involves I, you have to be a descendant from somebody with a 1928 application um, that ultimately evolved into a 19, I think, 33 or 34 census. But if, if the historical members have to be shown prior, you know, back to 1900, does that mean they have to take what, they're, what they have defined as tribal law as their historical members and actually now trace those people from the 1928 applications back to 1900? I, I guess I'm trying to figure out how do you define historical tribe when the tribe itself has defined it by tribal law what they're going to look to as as sort of their base role. And I know other tribes, I mean, they use the 1940 census um, as their base role to, to have to show descendancy from somebody. Uh, may I, John? Sure, please do. Um, historically, OFA has always treated those as distinct inquiries, uh, and the tribe has had to prove both that its members meet whatever the tribe sets as its membership criteria. And separately, uh, which is an internal matter, and, and the BIA will respect tribal law in that regard. But the obligation to demonstrate a historic tribe and dissent from that for purposes of the regulation is a federal matter, and they will require proof of that independent of proof, confirmation of the fact that your current members qualify for uh, the criteria that the tribe itself has set for membership. So, so really, you've got really two definitions of a historic tribe, and they both uh, are valid, and both have to be demonstrated for purposes of the regulations to, to qualify. Thank you. Terrific. All right. Any any other questions, Christina? We've got a question from Cole Smith. For some of the small tribes in Louisiana, their group cohesion in the 1700s and 1800s was substantially interrupted through Indian slavery. What's the best way to address the breaking up and reforming of these groups and new entities and communities, or does the date of 1900 for Criterion E eliminate the need to address this for those tribes? Uh, Patty, you're from Louisiana. Maybe we'll throw this one in your direction. Well, I'm from Louisiana. I think there's probably a couple people from Louisiana on the phone, um, and I, I mean, I think our Linda can help me with this as well. Um, but you, you know, based on the proposed finding in our discussions, even under the uh, previous criterion, say for example, in our petition, we had an ancestor who was from the 1700s. OFA in that respect said, well, yes this person is Indian, but you still have to show dissent as to what tribe the individual's um, from. And I, you know, I do think it's challenging because of what was happening in Louisiana. Um, but hopefully, you know, now we have something positive, which I think is looking at the historians and anthropologists' reports the Swanton, um, I'm not sure where the caller was from, but, um, uh, you know, Swanton's notes. Underhill went to South Louisiana as well. Um, there were other anthropologists who came to Louisiana. Um, and even being able to use historic information 
by whatever historians and anthropologists you have currently working with you. Um, I think the way Criterion E um, is written or clarified provides some hope. Uh, you still have to identify um, historic tribe and tribes. And I do know that there, you know, there's obviously an issue because the tribes were, there was a lot of movement in the, in the Mississippi Valley. Um, but I'd like, you know, Arlinda might have something to add in that respect. I think that's basically right, Patty. I think that this regulation allows you now to say, uh, pick a point in time before 1900 when you have affirmative proof of the existence of the community and identification of them by their historic tribal name and begin at that point in time and come forward and you could ignore everything that happened before. And, and I think that, that the, the regulations made a very sensible cut on that because they discuss, if you recall, in some of the response to comments, they discuss exactly some of the pressures that you described, and that is a lot of the disruption and dislocation that a lot of Indian communities suffered at the time of first white contact that went on for 30, 40, or even 50 years where they recombined, relocated, and, and got on a, a solid footing again, sometimes in a different place, by bringing in some perhaps remnants of other tribes or however they did it, they survived. So you don't have to prove that complicated history of combination and relocation and everything else. So long as you can identify a, an historic Indian community before 1900 and can prove them up until now, you should qualify under the regulation. And I just want to add that um, we have an attorney work group who's looking um, at issues dealing with federal recognition. And one of the things that we want to look at is the past precedent and how that can be used um, for petitioners and how, there, how the evidence was used. So there may be a future webinar on that, on that topic. Thanks, Patty. Any other questions, Christina? Uh, John Norwood has a question, so I'm going to unmute his line right now. Hello, John. John Norwood is the other co-chair of the task force. Thanks for joining us, John. Thank you for uh, for, for having this, and uh, hello to everyone. I, I had previously sent in a couple of questions, both to Patty and then also on, online, but I'll, I'll review a couple of thoughts that I have. Um, I fall in line with this issue of meeting criteria E, and that is that uh, if you have uh, a community of Indians that has already been uh, identified as a separate cultural or racial group by 1900, but referred to by only a nickname prior to 1900, subsequently clarified to mean Indian after 1900, shouldn't that still qualify as uh, a group from which you can descend to meet criterion E? Um, this would also include individuals that were born before 1900, but subsequently identified as Indian, let's say, you know, 1903, 1920. But, but you know, they're 80 years old. Would they qualify as people that you could descend from that meet that criteria uh, for E? Um, my view, John, this is Arlinda, my, my view on that would be that you you could. It, you would have to be, uh, when you put together the evidence, uh, you'd have to be more conscious of weaving into it reliance on earlier decisions because, as you've indicated, there have been earlier decisions, particularly the first 10 years of administration under the first set of regulations where they did rely on specifically that kind of evidence. And as the uh, Assistant Secretary has indicated if that was sufficient then, it should be sufficient now. Well, that's, that's, that's good news. Uh, the, the, that would also equate out to the Indian boarding schools, um, uh, individuals that attended Indian boarding, boarding schools, uh, their families, obviously they, if, if they attended an Indian boarding school, let's say in the 40s, um, and these are young people in their teens, the parents obviously would therefore be viewed as coming from an Indian community. So I'm assuming you're saying we can use that evidence to make this argument. 
uh, th that's a little more complicated, I think, because if you read the regulations carefully, even though they allow you to use evidence of enrollment at boarding schools as evidence of community NE, they say to the extent that that application process or otherwise indicates that that person was from an Indian community. So and, yeah, and, yeah, that, that's yeah, one of the issues that, that has come up is if if, if in a um, in the annual report or the yearbook of uh, that school that was run by the Board of Indian Education, is if, if it identifies the tribe the person came from, my assumption is, and they're not merely dealing, and, and there are a bunch of them from that tribe, they're not merely dealing with them as individuals, individual Indians, they're obviously identifying them as hailing from a tribal community because they identify the community next to their name. Well, what I would suggest you do in that event is go back and dig out the old regulations under which that school operated, because I found in some cases where the regulations will actually say that, 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 that we're targeting uh, Indian kids from those still, as they often refer to it, savage communities, you know, which in their mind means these are still people living, is, living in the traditional way. And if they say something like that in the regulations, then you've got pretty good proof that by enrolling that child in that process, it's an admission by the BIA that they are coming from an Indian community. Okay. And do you have any idea where these old regulations could be located? Yep, yep. The Department of the Interior Library, it, it's a great repository. They have every old regulation um, that the BIA has ever issued. <laughs> okay. And they will help you find it for that particular school. That, that's where I have found them before. Thank you very much. We have another question from Cole Smith. Is a subgroup of a larger petition, including multiple subgroups, evaluated on its own, separate from the other subgroups, or does one failure result in denial of all subgroups' recognition? That's a good question. I was wondering about that one myself. Patty, that's... I, I, I don't know if you're, I, uh, I don't know where Cole's from, I don't know if he's talking about um, the BCCM, because I think the way that um, petition was treated, it was treated that way specifically, like it was a, there's a confederation, and that's how it was explained to each of those communities, that um, if one failed, that they all fail. Um, but I think that you have an opportunity now to decide whether you're going to continue to petition as a confederation or petition separately and still have a confederation that you work through. I, I think that's what the question is, but um, if that's the question, I think now you have an opportunity um, to determine going forward clearly whether you're going to be a confederation petitioning together or a separate tribe. Okay. Any other questions, Christina? Um, a few of these questions seem to be directed to Interior, so we can pass those on. Um, okay. Again, if you've got a question, press the hand raise, and I will unmute your line. Uh, this is Arlinda. C could I just ask, Christina, if, if would you put on that list to Interior if they could tell us when they're going to have online the guidelines that the OFA website says they're working on now for the new regulations? Sure thing. Thank you. Yeah, and I think we could, you know, we can try to get answers to these questions, and then we could, you know, we can send, we have, everybody who's registered for this webinar, we can send an email out to you if we, if we're able to get answers. Any other questions out there? Go in once, go in twice. Well, if that's it, then I would like to thank Oh, both. we got oh, one yeah. more. Okay, great. Yeah, Pure Heart Rosario, I'm going to unmute your line. Hi, yeah. Quick question. You mentioned that you needed the tribal role from the tribe, from the secretary. Were you re 
re referring to the tribe's secretary or the secretary of the state? Whatever tribal roles were with the state. I didn't quite understand what you were saying when you were talking about the interaction. Okay. I, think, I think you're um I think we're referring to criterion E, which is descent from a historic tribe or tribes. Um, yeah, I was I was trying to ask the questions as you were going by the slides. I didn't know you were gonna hold off the questions till the end, so Okay. Um yeah, so that specifically says that the that the tribe um that the members descend from a tribal role directed by Congress are prepared by the secretary, which is referring to the assistant secretary. Um, okay, so it's the secretary of the state or whatever, but not the so tribal secretary. It's it's about the BIA, the assistant okay. secretary of Indian Affairs. Okay. Yeah. Just want a clarification because I know that uh, the village that I'm a member of has been in function since 1972, and they've passed on roles and. Every time there's a new secretary appointed, you know, we move those on up and we just, you know, have them chronologically secured. <laughs> yeah, this would be a tribal role prepared by the federal government. Okay, no problem. So again, it's federally recognized. Or prepared, it would have been prepared by the feds. Yes, not something prepared internally, though you can use that for other purposes. Okay, thank you. I've got another question from Nancy Carnley. If they cannot submit originals of certain documents, can they use their own tribally sanctioned officials to certify copies? I, I would say that would depend on what the document is. Um, if it's a document that's maintained in tribal records in the course of normal business by the tribe, I would say yes. But if it's a federal document or a state reported document, um, you probably would have to rely on their folks to authenticate it. Okay, and then she has a few follow-up questions, so I'm going to open up her line. Hi, Nancy. How are you today? Are you there, Nancy? Uh, I'm here. I'm sorry. Uh, what had happened, we'd had a fire back in 2004 that destroyed a lot of our documents and some books. It's now not published. And uh, we have come across a few copies that's been copied by people, and that's what we're wondering about. Oh, I see. That's going to be really hard yeah. because um, – Normally, when it's a record that's maintained in the normal course of business, then it, it's like under the federal rules of evidence, that's got a presumption of regularity. But when it's a document that's recreated by a private individual that won't share that same presumption of regularity, um, unless, of course, it is a, a tribal official that maintained and then reproduced it in the course of his or her normal business, you know, job or, or responsibilities for the tribe, then you can try it. Then it may be worth a try. Cause we, it, the fire was ruled as being arson, but they never found who did the arson. Oh, that's terrible. I'm sorry to hear that. And then just a few weeks, last year somebody went around in two counties and destroyed all the Indian historical markers. Oh, my. Hmm. Well, as sad as that is, proof of racial discrimination is proof of existence. Uh, that's why I was coming up with those questions. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. You're welcome. A uh, question from Laura Kelly now. I'm going to unmute her line. Hello. You have a question today? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yes. My question is sort of a technical one um, regarding Criterion E and the fact that you can use historians or anthropologists' evidence. Um, must that evidence be prior to 1900, or should, does the historian have to be literally a, like a document from the 1880s, or could it be Swanton in 1907, but using evidence prior to 1900, 
Um, does that make sense? I'm trying to figure out where the evidence bar is when you're using historian or anthropologist for criterion E. That, that is a very good question. Um, when they were considering this language, we had proposed that they include language that would have made it clear that the important date was not so much the date that the historian or anthropologist prepared the report, but the evidence upon which that report relied, so that if that historian or anthropologist relied upon evidence from pre-1900, that would have sufficed. But they did not include that language. The language now just says, records created by historians and anthropologists in historical times. So if you read that literally, that suggests that the actual anthropological or historical report had to be before 1900. But then if you look at the cases they urge you to rely on in interpreting E from the early days, uh, Porch Creek, Tunica Biloxi, and some of the others, Timbisha Shoshone, they clearly rely on documents that were produced after 1900. Right, that's where my confusion came in, like with Ruth Underhill, because right. you know she's not even close like Swanson is. And right. um, so then following your advice of saying according to the precedent of, and then relying on that um, kind of thing. But yeah, that, that particular point was, was confusing. Yes, I, I think you have the answer right there is you, is you rely, yeah. weave the whole thing in with heavy reliance on the early decisions as precedent and, and try to bind them that way. Great. Thank you very much. We have a question from Earl Evans. I'm going to unmute his line now. Earl? Hi. Um, I, I apologize. Since I submitted that question, I, I'm, I, I think I've got the answer to it, but basically it was referring back to the conversations about the Indian identification concerning uh, Criterion E. Um, that incident of, of Indian identifications uh, without the tribal affiliation mentioned is pretty common throughout many locations. Even in 2015, if you disregard tribal records, there are not any public, state, and federal records in most in instances that will identify the tribal affiliation of each Indian individual. So, so while I understand what Patty and Ms. Arlinda said about uh, utilizing uh, records at a certain time period that do indicate tribal affiliation, I guess what, I, what I'm asking specifically is what in terms of how the BIA is going to interpret uh, these regulations applies to, to instruct reviewers that they should consider uh, circumstantial evidence surrounding tribal affiliation when you have instances of individuals identified as Indian without listing tribal affiliations. A lot of times you'll see something in records such as land acquired from the Indians uh, in, in many instances without that tribal affiliation. So that, that's more particularly what I'm interested in. How, how will the BIA in terms of its, uh, the regulations, where, where do you see that as being uh, an effective instruction to staff to make sure that they include evidence uh, that of a circumstantial nature that pretty much grabs that tribal affiliation where there is none listed for Indian individuals? Well, th th that's going to be sort of on the frontier kind of issues here under these regulations. Um, um, although it, it, signs are encouraging that, that the BIA will be flexible and basically let you weave together a story from a number of sources that will say, well, this person was related to that person, and that person was identified as, as historic Indian, but the other person was only identified as Indian. But because they're related, they must be the same. That kind of thing, and, and allow you to imply things, the truth of the matter, rather than having absolute proof of the matter. And if you look at the... Um, final determination, for example, the last one that they did under the old regulations for the Pamunkey tribe, there were actually a couple of ancestors there who in the proposed finding had been identified as lacking sufficient proof of, as a member of the historic tribe. But in the final determination, they found that they were Indian by doing exactly what you're describing, is, is weaving together a story around that person 
to, to imply, and they actually use the word implication, the implication is clear that this person was a member of the historic tribe, even though there wasn't a document black and white that said it. And so, you know, that, that's kind of what you have to do around that period of time is to try to weave the story together, pulling, pulling every bit of evidence you've got so that you can create the implication for as many numbers of your ancestors as you can that they were identified not just as Indian, but from the historic tribe. And I think that's very important um, to look at that implication because the standard is supposed to be reasonable likelihood. And I think that's probably where your um, question comes from, how well that's what the standard is. We asked for to make sure that that's clarified to provide direction to OFA. Um, and um, it was decided not to do that. That you know, um, that's what the response was in the comments. But that it is reasonable likelihood, and they discussed that. Um, but I I do agree that we probably need to be vigilant in our petitions to use that language um, for those implications as to why it's reasonably likely that this person is also descended from a historic Indian. I, I, I would add very briefly, and uh, I hate to be cynical, but um, uh, we have to remember with whom we're dealing with in that office as well, and they are not happy about these new regulations. <laughs> um, so we need to understand there's going to be some resistance in the application and interpretation of it from some of the professional staff at OFA. Hence my question. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't know if the guidelines will have any direction to to the staff. So I guess when that comes out, we'll be able to to review that. I'm not sure. Okay. Are there any other questions, Christina? John, John, this is Frank. Am I still live? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I I just uh, wanted to observe, make an observation here that you know. With these, we're really just on the, the doorstep of these new regulations, and uh, we have no idea what form type of lawsuits and other things are going to come down the road, where what the how the courts may interpret these things, and so we can make our best guess as to what they mean today, but over the next several years, we're going to have a lot better things, as both our Linda and Patty have pointed out. There's a lot of things where, although there's some that are quite clear, there are others where it's a bit unclear. And generally, people are going to try to use those to the best of their ability uh, to their advantage. And some of them may be successful, and some may not. And in some cases, when they're not successful, they've tried going to court on them. And so well, we do have this, uh, we have this new uh, provision for an administrative judge to be hearing these things. You know, a lot of these questions are probably going to be resolved uh, over time, and not something that's going to be resolved in the next month or two by by guidance that comes out. That's true. We've got one last question, and this is directed to Interior, and so we'll forward it on. It's from George Keen about whether the department has determined whether it will need to publish a correction to the final rule in the Federal Register based on having identified any inconsistent language or confusing typographical errors. So we will forward that on as well. Okay, thanks. Well, if, if that's our last question, then perhaps we should wrap it up. I think we're getting near the, the end of our time frame. Uh, thank you very much, Patricia and Arlinda and, and Frank and everybody who participated. And even though they've already departed, uh, thanks very much to Kevin and, and Larry for their help and all their work on the regulations. Um, that's it. If you have any further questions, please follow up with Christina and I, and, and we'll try to get back to you uh, if we can get answers on these questions from with Interior. And um, everyone have a great day, and thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, John.